Hello. Hello. How are you? Good, good. Really excited to be here. Exciting night. Thanks for having me. Yes. No, thank you. Lots of people right at six. This is so great. Wow, look at that. Let's see. I'm going to make you co-host, Allie, so you can help me manage the waiting room. Let's see. There we go. There we go. Amazing. All right. Well, welcome everybody. Super excited to be here. This is our first uh, women's cohort, and it just happens to be um, the 26th or the 31st anniversary of the ADA. So super excited to be celebrating it with you all. Um, for a bit of context of who I am and what this is all about, so my name is Diego, Diego Mariscal. I'm the founder of Together International and we're an accelerator program by and for entrepreneurs with disabilities. And we uh, focus on running an accelerator program that is 12 weeks long that focuses on really helping entrepreneurs with disabilities grow and develop their businesses. And so this is um, our pitch event, which is a culminating night uh, for 12 weeks of hard work. So really excited that uh, we get to celebrate it with you all. Helping me moderate is gonna be Ali. So Ali, do you wanna uh, introduce yourself? Hi everyone, uh, my name is Ali Kennan and I'm the community manager for Together International. Amazing. Um, so before we start, I wanted to give the floor to Adriana who was the winner. Oh, hello, Judy. <laughs> Good to see you. You just popped on my screen. Um, I wanted to give the floor to Adriana. She was a participant in the women's cohort and the winner of uh, last year's uh, pitch competition in December. So Adriana, why don't you go ahead and share a bit about your experience with, with, with us. Yeah, so hi, um, I'm Adriana Malazzi. I am the founder and CEO of Puffin Innovations. We are creating assistive technology to allow people with disabilities to lead more independent and inclusive lives. Uh, our flagship product is a mouth-operated input device that allows people to have access or hands-free access to their consumer electronics. Um, and as Diego mentioned, uh, I won the last pitch competition, which was last year. Um, and that was great. And um, with the winning, uh, I used it basically to uh, cover uh, overhead costs such as, you know, um, servers and things like that for Puffin. Uh, so that really helped out, especially during the pandemic. Um, and so, you know, today is July 26, which is so meaningful to us as people with disabilities. Um, and we have Judy on here. I was not expecting Judy to be here, but uh, it is such an honor to have her here. And uh, I actually gave a talk this morning um, in honor of ADA Day. And, you know, I was speaking of Judy and the fact that I was 13 years old, literally two weeks prior to the signing of the ADA, I turned 13 and I had no idea that Judy even existed. I had no idea what was going on in our country at that time. At that time. Uh, and, you know, it would have been great to have known that there were people out there 
fighting for our rights, fighting for my right to have a future just like anyone else, to be able to dream and fulfill those dreams just like anyone else in this country. And so, you know, that is why we celebrate today is because we do have this legislation in place and it is not perfect, of course. Um, and one of the main things is that as a society, our attitudes, our, um, the, the way we see people, our, the stigma associated with disability has not changed. And that is what needs to change. We could have all the, law, the laws protecting us but until our society sees us as people, sees us as people belonging in our society, then those laws are useless to us. And that is what needs to change. And so happy IDA day. Uh, good luck to the ladies pitching tonight. And um, hello, Judy. Great to see you. And yeah. Thank you. Adriana, there are many people here who may not know who, who Judy is or what that means. So can you just give a brief context? <laughs> Judy is the <laughs> queen of, <laughs> uh, of the disability rights movement. I'm sorry, Judy, but I do like to call you <laughs> the queen of the disability rights movement. Um, she is a powerhouse. She is a phenomenal leader. Um, she just is an amazing human being. And she has that ability to relate to everyone. And I think that is what makes a good and powerful leader, is the ability to relate to anyone and everyone. And, and make people come together for a cause. Um, so that is Judy in a nutshell. There's so much more, more to Judy. Uh, everyone should definitely watch Crip Camp. They should read her book, Being Human, uh, amazing. And I, I don't know what else more to say about Judy. There's just so much more, but we don't have all night to talk about Judy. So right. <laughs> I think we should move on to the show. Yes. Amazing. Thank you, Adriana. Um, if uh, I know we are trying to pin the other interpreter to make sure that um, they can switch, but I'm having trouble um, locating Taylor. So, oh, there we go. Yay, great, great. All right, um, thank you, Adriana. That was, that was really, uh, really interesting story and definitely a good reminder of what the ADA does. You know, I, I grew up in, for those of you who don't know, I grew up in Mexico. I was born in the States by accident. Uh, my parents were shopping uh, and I uh, was born six months and a half into my mom's pregnancy. Um, she jokes and says that I've always been really stubborn even before I was born. And so I grew up without the ADA, without knowing, um, having those protections. And so being in the States and being in a place where there is a civil rights movement and there is um, strong advocates in place fighting for things like the ADA and other laws and regulations is really a privilege. And so I'm really excited that we get to celebrate that uh, today and um, hopefully in many more events to come. So with that, uh, this program would not be possible without Wendy Diamond. Wendy, I see you're in the audience. If you can unmute yourself, that would be great. Would love to hear from you and your commitment to helping women entrepreneurs and specifically women with disabilities. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And first of all, I mean, I know this is the most important day 
to, to everybody here today, but I wanted to first say like, my gosh, how do I even begin this? Wow. Um, is, you know, I was lucky enough to kind of come across Crip Camp. And this is the whole reason why we're here today is I watched that movie. I cried. I laughed. I could not believe and I'm I'm super mad because that should have won the Oscar it was the best documentary I've ever seen and I was obsessed to find Judy because I was like oh my god like I want to be Judy when I grow up I mean my god when I watched that I said my uh, this woman is the most impressive woman I've ever seen forget about like all these celebrities and Instagram people and all these things I mean Judy so I went on a journey to find Judy human and I found her LinkedIn network 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 everyone anyway, <laughs> I found Judy and I was like, Judy, Judy, Judy. I mean, my God, can like I interviewed, can you be part of Women's Entrepreneurship Day? And that's where I met Judy. And that's where this whole conversation came where we need to support women with disabilities and entrepreneurship. And that's when I said, oh my gosh, I know exactly. And that's when I went to one of our board members for Women's Entrepreneurship Day, Lorena Arbus. Um, who is one of the biggest advocates whose family founded United Cerebral Palsy Foundation, also ABC Television. And she's one of the biggest advocates to support women with disabilities, but everybody with disabilities, not just women. And, you know, it's been a super supporter of our foundation supporting women entrepreneurs around the world. Um, I'm Wendy Diamond. I'm an investor. I invest in social impact. I'm in about 20 companies uh, fighting to support uh, the world and, and making an imprint in this world a positive one. I'm in four funds as a limited partner. I bring you know impactful companies to them. I bring women-led companies to them and I fight for them to get investment dollars. And most importantly, we wouldn't be here today if I didn't create Women's Entrepreneurship Day when I learned in 2013, um, I ended up in Honduras on vacation, not realizing it was the murder capital of the world. And that's when I um, volunteered for an organization that provides microloans to poor women. I was just gonna go for a couple hours, but I ended up spending like three days meeting all these unbelievable women that were getting these $100 microloans that were changing their lives. And literally from that moment, I learned that these women, these impoverished women getting these $100 microloans were paying these loans back at a 98% rate crazy. And 90% of the money they earn goes back to educate their children and provide for their families. And when women are empowered in business, they have self-confidence and dignity. They don't allow human rights violations. And at that time in 2013, only 1% of venture dollars went towards women founders. Crazy, right? And when you looked in the media, only there was not a lot out there about women founders, or women entrepreneurs. So that's why I came back after that experience and I will never forget it. And I created an official day in this world proclaimed by two the US Congress, proclaimed by Governor Cuomo, proclaimed all over the world. And we're now celebrated in 144 countries. We have our own day called Women's Entrepreneurship Day on November 19th to empower women in business to alleviate poverty. Because we believe change happens from the ground up not the top down, but we need the top. And as you see what happened with Judy and this whole thing, we hope that our movement will make as big an impact as Judy has made. So I'm so happy to be here, so honored. Um, Diego, Judy introduced us to Diego. Diego took it, took it all in and he made this all happen. And it's just so impressive to see what he's done. And I'm so honored to be here. Thank you so much. Well, this has been truly, truly a collaborative effort. And Wendy, I am so happy and honored that you got to be a part of this uh, movement. So you're one of the most positive persons I know. So thank you for being here and thank you for uh, supporting our work and the work of these uh, amazing women that we're gonna hear from today. And Adriana, that was a great speech. I was like, oh my God, Mr. Craig, that was phenomenal. All right, thank y'all. I'll, I'll go mute now. <laughs> All right. So now I am super excited to introduce our judges. Um, and this is this is in alphabetical order, so bear with me. Um, so if you guys can, when I call your name, if you can introduce yourself, talk about um, who you are, your uh, your work, and then we can take it from there. 
Um, so first up, we have Barbara Guterman. Hi, thank you so much for having me, Diego, and wonderful to meet all you women who I've not met before. I know today's gonna be really exciting. I am a serial entrepreneur. I've been an entrepreneur for the last 36 years, involved in all different kinds of businesses from telecom to internet startups, to fine jewelry, to women's activewear. Um, but I'm also a disability advocate and um, am really active in the space. And my, my personal objective is to help make the world a more inclusive place for everyone, in, especially women. So it's really a pleasure to be here. And thank you so much, Diego, for asking me to be part of this panel. I cannot wait to hear about um, all the advances that the women have made in their company since we last met. Yeah, um, Barbara was one of the speakers for our speaker series, and you were one of the uh, the favorites. So no pressure there, but you were definitely one of the favorites. So thank you, thank you, Barbara. Amazing. Okay, so now Hannah, let's turn it over to you. Hi, Diego. Thanks so much. I'm. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you, Diego. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, I'm Hannah. I, I'm on the Google for Startups team. So working with Google to support startups around the world and I'm particularly passionate about supporting founders with disabilities. I identify as having disabilities and have done a lot of different disability inclusion initiatives I'm at Google and outside of Google. And I'm just so excited to be here and honored to be among the most impressive panel and room full of people. So I'm totally blown away and nervous and so excited to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. And we're, we're gonna do something really cool at the end of the year with Google for startups. So six, stay six, tuned six. for that. Um, awesome, awesome. So now Prita, let's turn it over to you. Hi there. Hello. So nice to meet, the, meet everybody here. Um, so I've had, a, I've worn a couple of different hats throughout my life. Um, I've been an educator. I was the Dean for Science at Emory where I, that's when I started my startup and that journey changed me forever. And I, you know, my startup was acquired, but that convinced me that there are so many conversations at which women have no place at the table. And out of that, and it was, it was, and it was challenging in so many ways to, to be a woman entrepreneur in technology. And kind of out of that grew my commitment that I was going to do what I could from now on to make sure that I could lessen some of those burdens, those obstacles for other women, um, whether they're entrepreneurs or in the venture industry. And one of the ways that I, it was an opportunity that came to me. I am now a, a VC in a very diverse firm. Diego knows one of the GPs in that. We are um, four of us. Um, I am the woman. There are two um, African-Americans and one physically challenged person. So in a sense, we represent many of the difficulties that many people ought not to face, but they do. And I'm on a, a crusade, which I can see I'm joined by so many wonderful women I can see around the room. And I look forward to learning more about you and more about the startups at the table. So thank you for this opportunity, Diego. Amazing, amazing. And part of the reason, because, you know, um, Zoom tries to get you to do like webinars and things like that. But part of the reason that we wanted to keep this as a regular meeting where you get to see everyone's faces is so that you guys can meet each other and network through this opportunity because it's all about creating a movement. So feel free to use the chat, message each other, exchange contact information because we want to keep the conversations going beyond, um, beyond the room tonight. So um, let's move to the next person. Rachel, so excited, Rachel, for you to have you join us. Rachel is the board chair of Together International. So very excited to hear from her. Hello, everyone. My name is Rachel Kretzky. I am um, on the board of Together International as the board chair. Um, full time, I'm the founder and CEO of UPACE. We are the number one mobile app platform for community rec centers are on mobile engagement. And I also am the organizer for DC Startup Week, which is a community of over 10,000 entrepreneurs and startups in the DMV region, where every year we put together a five-day conference this year, October 18th to the 22nd, as a way for everyone to network, collaborate, engage, and connect 
um, as we find it so important for the startup ecosystem to support one another um, as you grow and as you expand all your different startups and companies. So if anyone here is interested in getting involved with that, it's a free community where you're able to access a lot of important resources as a founder. Amazing. Thank you, Rachel. Um, let's see, Gina Clyde, super excited to have you joining us. My friend Diego, thank you for including me in such a <laughs> very dynamic event. I'm so uh, happy to be here and happy to be included. I am uh, a recently launched fund, the Smart Job Fund at Impact Assets. But before that, I was a disability rights lawyer for a long time. Uh, the Smart Job Fund was launched at the start of this new year, and it's dedicated to closing the disability wealth gap through the lens of work um, and future of work in particular. We have four main in, in impact investment uh, theses, upskilling and reskilling workers, uh, accelerators and incubators of the kind that Diego, you're successfully running. Uh, the, that's part of our investment thesis is supporting good programs like yours around the world work-related technology. Uh, we're very interested in the next generation of technology to support new ways of workers with disabilities being included in new and emerging industries. And finally, we're, one of the things that's most pertinent to today is looking at underrepresented founders with a disability lens and really looking for people with truly investable business ideas who need that early stage support, flexible risk capital, so we couldn't be more thrilled both by the success of Together International and the good work that Diego is doing, but also by the types of founders that are here tonight. So I'm super excited to be here and to be included. And also shout out to our Board of Advisors member, Judy. <laughs> amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Diego. Amazing, amazing. And Wendy will also be joining us as a, as a judge, but she needs no... Uh, introduction since she introduced herself a uh, uh, while ago. So I also want to acknowledge that this program would not be possible without my partner in crime, Kim, who's been amazing. She has given so much to this program and so much to these women. So I want to make sure uh, she gets a chance to introduce herself and also to say that I am super thankful for her support through Luma Labs and the Women's Entrepreneur Network. So thank you, Kim, for everything you're doing. Thanks, Diego. I'm so excited to be here tonight with everyone. This has been an incredible journey. Diego and I first imagined uh, an accelerator for women entrepreneurs with disabilities, I think in November, December of last year. So tonight represents a lot of work over the last seven or eight months. And it's just incredible to see the, his vision uh, come to life uh, with the celebration. I also just want to acknowledge all of the women here tonight. What an incredible accomplishment it is to be, celebrate, to be celebrating the launch of these new businesses. During a pandemic where 100% of all jobs lost in December 2020 were women's jobs, it's a breath of fresh air to see women entrepreneurs starting, growing, and thriving. And I'm just so thrilled to be part of this amazing journey. Women entrepreneurs are starting more businesses than ever before, but our work is still not finished. It's part of why I created the Women Entrepreneurs Network in 2016. We are providing the education, mentorship, resources, support, and access to capital that women desperately need to succeed. I'm really proud of the fact that in addition to helping Diego create this amazing program, putting 13 ambitious female entrepreneurs with disabilities through our very first accelerator, uh, the women in my other accelerator programs, we had 100% success rate in terms of every business that was part of our program in 2020 and 2021 survived the pandemic. 70% of them raised venture capital and collectively they raised more than $10 million in VC funds. So I'm just really amazing, amazing to be part of this journey with so many ambitious women. I wanted to take a quick moment to thank Ali Keenan and Liz Collins who have been our incredible support staff and we couldn't have gotten through this 15 weeks without them. And I also want to acknowledge the uh, speakers from our series, Secrets of Success, sorry, <laughs> Secrets of Success series. 
In addition to our 15 week accelerator program, we also had a 15 week speaker series and we managed to get some of the most incredible and inspirational speakers you could ever imagine. During our program, uh, during our program we really challenged the entrepreneurs to think about themselves and their business diff differently. We created a dynamic program and an empowerment platform and we challenged them to dream big to dream so big that it scared them a little bit and to get outside their comfort zone and really make magic happen. And that is not easy to do. So I'm so amazed at the courage that the women in this program displayed to get through. Every woman completed the program and it's just, I pinch myself sometimes with amazement at how they have grown and changed and their businesses have evolved. And together with Diego, we really helped to equip these women with the business skills and tools to develop those big scary dreams and turn them into actionable plans and bring those dreams to life. So what you see here tonight is not the end of the journey for these amazing women, it is the beginning. And I'm so proud to have been able to work with them and of the work that they have done. And I'm just honored and humbled to be part of this program with you, Diego. So thank you to everyone for being here tonight. Thank you, Kim. It, it's been an incredible, incredible journey and we couldn't have done it without you. So really, really, really appreciate it. All right, now to the main event. I'm gonna turn it over to um, Ali, but thank you everyone. It's been really, really exciting to see, see it all come together. Awesome, let's get this party started. Our first um, entrepreneur that is going to be joining us is Keely Catwells, uh, the creator of Sea Talent. So Keely, if you want to begin um, sharing your screen. Um, oops, it says that it's disabled. Participant screen sharing oh, is not go. available at the time. Oh, and just before we get started, I just want to, um, reiterate how the dynamic will go. So uh, participants will have three minutes to present, then we'll do five minutes of Q&A. For the judges, if you have a question, please use the right the um, raise hand function on Zoom. There's a little uh, button on the, on the bottom of Zoom that says reactions, and there's a hand raise function in there. So um, if you can use that, to indicate that you have a question, that'd be great. Um, or you can also put the question in the chat and we'll do our best to monitor it. Uh, folks will have five minutes for Q&A. So if we don't get to your question, um, folks will have the chat that they can go back and look at it. You also should have gotten the, a, the uh, judging sheet, which we'll be using to select who the winners are. So um, if you have any questions, please reach out to Ali or Liz who are here um, and they can help you direct, direct you to the right links. All right. Amazing. Okay. Keith, why don't you take it away? I'm gonna remove myself, Keely. So um, if you wanna unmute and whenever you are ready, feel free. Okay, amazing. Thank you so much. And firstly, a massive thank you to Together International. It's been an incredible experience and I've learned so much. Uh, so thank you. My name is Keely and I am the CEO and founder of Sea Talent. I became disabled when I was 17 years old and quickly realized that the world was no longer made with me in mind. I moved out to LA and lost a job, not because of my disability, but because of Hollywood's ableism. And this is why I founded Sea Talent which is a talent management company that represents high profile deaf and disabled artists, athletes, and influencers with the goal of normalizing disabled people being experts in subjects beyond disability. We also consult for companies helping, helping them tap into an untapped trillion dollar market. Disability is your business. The disability market is larger than China and is an emerging market just as others have in the past at 1.8 billion people and 1.9 trillion in disposable income. We have many departments, including our actors, our influencers behind the camera, and then we have our consulting side of the company. Our current and previous clients include Virgin Media, Adam and Eve DDB, Lego, NBC, Intertech, the IPC, United Nations, and more. 
We are disability owned, led, and we're taking the opportunity of diversity with integrity. Elizabeth Yin is my senior talent manager at C Talent. She was initially hired as a talent assistant and was recently promoted about six months ago to senior talent manager. In just four months, she has made $274,000 in revenue alone, just herself. So we're not only empowering our talent, but also empowering our disabled managers to make money too. I am an entrepreneur and disability activist. I am a Forbes 30 under 30 honoree um, of this year. I am an Airy Changemaker, Princess Diana Award winner, and I'm a board member on Lady Gaga's Born This Way Foundation. I've also spoken at many notable organizations and companies, including Google, UCLA, NBC, the United Nations, the Cannes Film Festival, and more. Some of our milestones include 65 incredible clients with a combined following of over 85 million people. We've got 10 consulting contracts with Fortune 500 companies, and we've won 10 notable awards. In 2020, we did 139,000 in revenue, and this year alone, we've already hit our milestone of half a million in revenue. Actually, just to this date, we've done 539,000 in revenue. We have multiple income streams, including commission, retainer, and our new subscription-based platform, which is a tech platform that allows disabled talent to connect with these major entertainment companies. We are official vendors of Netflix, Disney, Lego, Hulu, and more. And this is our company reel, which I will share with you after this pitch to watch in your own time, because I know we don't have time for that now. And this is our wonderful office in the, at the Hollywood Production Center on North Gower. And we are looking for $500,000 of investment. And this will allow us to hire 33 managers as well as the supporting staff within the first year and we will make back the money and in profit within year two. So thank you so much for your time and for this amazing platform and all of the education and, and help today. And thank you so much. And that is, that is it. Thank you so much, Keely. Amazing. All right, now we wanna open it up to, um, to the judges to ask questions of Keely. What has been the, uh, Keely, what has been the biggest obstacle? Have you seen any, anybody say, I mean, I could, I mean, just your presentation alone, I'm like, yeah, okay, where do I sign up? I mean, so <laughs> where have you seen obstacles? Because I can't even imagine that you'd have any issues, to be honest. Yeah, I think um, there's been a few obstacles. Obviously, the first one is the systemic oppression that we constantly face as disabled people and the initial problem of accessibility within the entertainment industry. Uh, and that's really what inspired our consulting side of the company, you know, being in the trenches every day, getting those phone calls of um, companies and entertainment companies saying, oh, you know, uh, unfortunately, we didn't book an accessible venue, so we're going to have to carry your client up the stairs. And we're like, no, you're not. You're never going to carry our client up the stairs. So really being able to advocate for our clients is so important while the world is still, you know, unaccessible um, in many different places. So I would say that's been, been a barrier as well as education. Um, I know that we're slowly but surely moving in the right direction within the industry, um, but it's definitely been getting a, past those negative stereotypes from, from those you know, previous times where we've had you know, Captain Hook and the Hunchback of Notre Dame and getting away from those and into this new, um, this new phase and this new era of disability representation. I think, can I, can I just um, add to that? So I have to thank Wendy for firing off the first question because it's always easier to do the second question. So um, my question to you is, um, I see that you have a clear ask. What, could you give me a little more color on what that's gonna be used for? How will you be spending that? And yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So currently uh, we have 10 staff and all of our managers are on a commission basis. So they get just under half of what C-Talent gets when we make commission from a client. And we want this structure to change so both the managers and uh, C-Talent can be more profitable. And based on the averages that we've seen within the past year from, uh, from what we've made, we'd be able to give everyone a base salary and then a quarterly bonus. So the money will be used to change our current pay structure and also hire an additional 33 managers. 
Uh, and each manager represents between 15 to 25 clients each. So this is a, a massive, um, you know, a big, big employment uh, opportunity. So we're able to, to really give those opportunities both to the managers and to the talent. Thanks. Uh, I, I, Diego, I just wanted to ask Kelly, you know, essentially how would you measure success if you had to reduce it to one metric? Oh, wow, what a great question. I would say, you know, I think it's about creating superstars who just so happen to be disabled. Because I think that has an influence to a huge, you know, this is a, it's a massive, um, that would give a massive message to society. UTA, WME and CAA, they represent people right now like Viola Davis and George Clooney and Naomi Campbell and those big stars. And we want to be doing the equivalent. So I would say it's representing the disabled equivalent of those, of those companies. I have one more question. What about uh, the contracts with the actors or whomever is, is part, of your, a part of your agency? What are the contracts like? So once you bring them in, they get roles and what leads them to say, I'm gonna stay with you versus CAA or I am, you know, whoever. So we have uh, flexible contracts. It definitely does depend on the talent. We're very, you know, we customize that to the talent um, and they're usually locked in for about a year, but if anyone's unhappy, uh, they can leave within 30 days and we can give also 30 days notice. Uh, but usually they all stay with us. We have an amazing, uh, we, every talent that stayed with us, they've, I mean, we've still got people from, from day one. And um, I think that's because when you're disabled in this industry, many other agents and managers don't take into consideration the accessibility requirements. They don't fight for the equal pay and above, um, and they just don't get it. And they don't, the one thing that we do that many people don't do is creating roles and campaigns and ideas with our talent that we then pitch to companies rather than just waiting for things that come in and seeing the breakdowns that usually won't fit our clients or usually won't be ideal for our clients is really creating those with our talent and then pitching them to the companies. So I, I think that's why they stay with us. Awesome, thank you, Keely. That is all we have for Q&A, but you are welcome to answer any questions in the chat. Yes. Okay. Next up we have Reina, which I am super excited to hear from. Reina has been a supporter uh, of, of disability rights for a while and a supporter of our work. So Really appreciate it and excited to hear from you, Reina. Thank you. Okay, let me make sure that I am able to share. Okay, just making sure that I'm not the only one seeing this. Are we good? Yeah. We're good. All right, awesome. Thank you so much. Hello, my name is Raina and I'm the owner of Willow Spoon Creative, an accessible digital content agency. Accessibility is about more than wheelchair ramps and elevators. And in a pandemic world, businesses need to be especially competitive to retain existing customers and reach new ones. Digital platforms such as websites, social media, and downloadable content are where many barriers are created because they fail to accommodate non-mobility conditions involving vision, hearing, neurodivergence, and sensory overload. I've faced these barriers not only as a customer, but also as a business owner. Nearly every workshop, market, and networking event I've attended, both virtual and in person, was inaccessible on many levels. There were no accommodations available because people with disabilities are not even seen as clients, let alone potential business owners. When resources are not designed to include us, we absolutely end up being excluded from opportunities, and I'm changing that. The list and create a successful content and virtual best practices workshops bridge those gaps. We educate businesses on how to integrate inclusive principles throughout their platforms, elevating them above their competitors. We also empower women, especially women with disabilities, to grow their own companies through one-on-one -on -one coaching and small group classes. We focus primarily on small businesses and nonprofits. 
There is no shortage of either here in the DMV, and I will happily take a piece of that. We will reach this market through community organizations, our workshops and networking events, and never underestimate the power of client referrals. This is why I believe in choosing the right clients and building strong, lasting relationships. So why should businesses care about reaching this demographic? Because the 61 million adults and 3 million children in the US with disabilities, along with those in their immediate circle, are all looking for accessibility. What do you think the buying power is of that community? $490 billion, yes, billion with a B. That is right behind African-Americans and Hispanics, which are the two most powerful minority groups, yet businesses fail to even consider people with disabilities as the financially attractive demographic. That is a huge missed opportunity. We also know the power of conscientious consumerism. You don't get a pass on inclusion simply because you're not on the S&P 500. As a woman with a lifelong disability, if I can't get into your store or onto your website, you're not getting into my wallet, and it's as simple as that. Now, over $23 billion of that disposable income is right here in the DMV. If businesses want to stay competitive, they will need accessible digital content to reach all customers with disabilities, including those with invisible conditions. Willisbone Creative can generate $100,000 or more in revenue by year three, but I plan to reach that milestone sooner. The $5,000 award from this cohort happens to be the perfect amount to cover remaining startup costs, as well as enable me to host two workshops in September, which will convert new clients for the upcoming holiday season. Thank you so much for your time and attention, and I am happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Reina. All right. Um, so if we can hear from the judges, that would be great. Um, it was a great presentation, Reina. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Reina. This is Barbara. I can't see the group because I think we're still looking at your slides, but um, thank you for your presentation. It was really wonderful. Um, I'm just wondering, can you explain where you think your revenue stream is going to be coming from? I know you had a number of different customer segments, but where will you be focusing mainly? Mm -hmm. Yep, um, I'm happy to move to some of our appendix slides for that. So um, I do expect about 50% will come from the digital, the accessible digital content creation itself, uh, with coaching and networking taking up about an additional 40% and the workshops, um, the final 10%. This would be the first year, obviously. Those numbers could change wildly. You never know what's going to uh, be the most receptive uh, to the world, but I do know that there is a need and a want for all of these um, services. Reina, just so you know, it seems like there's some static coming through your mind. Oh. Um, is this better at all? Sound, that sounds better. And can I just okay. follow on question? Um, it's so, uh, there's so much going on in terms of digital content on the internet. How are you, um, how are you going to position yourself so that you stand out and people know to come to you for your services, which are obviously very needed? Thank you. Um, great question. Well, um, as much digital content as there is out there, very little of it is actually accessible or designed with accessibility in mind. Uh, so that is where the workshops come into play and hosting events. Um, social media is a huge powerhouse and you absolutely, I think, have to get out there and just show people what you're doing. And that word gets around um, in my nearly 25 years uh, as a as a freelancer in technical theater, the majority of my work came from positive referrals and repeat clients. You build that strong relationship and that gets around. People want that. Great. I see we have a question from Hannah. Um, Hannah, you want me to read it out loud or do you want to speak it? It. I can also say it was kind of just a plus one on what's already been asked, but I was curious to kind of better understand the landscape of this like content creation versus the coaching and networking, or sorry, the, mm -hmm. the workshopping and the coaching. Yep. I imagine, you know, people use different apps like Canva to create content or they're doing it within their design. So I'm curious kind of how you, how you thought about the overall landscape and which piece of that pie you're cutting into. 
Uh, Canva is certainly a useful tool, um, but it's not the only one out there. Obviously, uh, Adobe is a very powerful suite, and so there are ways to, um, uh, to, to, to really create a lot of different types of content for what people need. And uh, the most important thing is that I think when you are doing this, that it is compatible with assistive technology so that if someone has a screen reader, they're able to access the, the content just as well as someone who doesn't rely on that technology. Yeah. Raina, uh, I have a question. Um, yeah. What would be the, I, looking at this and I think to myself, my gosh, I would, looking at one-on-one, -on -one, I, I feel like companies, you know, small, medium-sized businesses, you know, that actually would be more opt to pay more money for your services, mm -hmm. much more interested in having you look at the company and say, how can they become more um, acceptable to these, to what you're asking and what your company is all about? Because I feel like they would need this. You know, this is something that people um, are definitely right now are really aware of the issues of this and that they would want your services. So why are you not taking this kind of and looking because you're going to spend all that time one on one, but taking it and creating um, opportunities for companies to get more engaged in this. Hi. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing. Um, great question. And I'm not saying that I won't take those opportunities because I happily will. Um, but I also know that quite frankly, small businesses are generally priced out of being able to access these resources. And they're also the ones that have the most one-on-one -on -one relationship with their communities. So it, it is going to have a greater impact. Absolutely, I will work with larger companies, happy to do that uh, and happy to take that, that bigger um, paycheck, which then helps me cut costs for maybe smaller companies who aren't in a position, but still really wanna do that work and still really want to have that commitment to accessibility. So I think there's a, a broad range of people that uh, and ways that I can make these services available. I think you should work with Judy and get a law <laughs> passed that all companies above X amount of people need to do this. I, I mean, two New Yorkers, we get out of our way. We're, we're making things happen. You can not stop I'm from us. Ohio, <laughs> just so you know, I'm from Ohio. <laughs> uh, but Judy and I are both New Yorkers. And you know what? We, we'll bring you in. We're happy to have that Ohio power behind us. <sighs> Amazing. Amazing. Really, really, really quick question before the second is left. Um, where are you in your trajectory? Like how many customers, what revenue, and what are you trying to hit? Um, so obviously still very much in the beginning of Willow Spin Creative. However, I personally am not starting from scratch. I'm starting from experience and all of the business that I've um, run and done for a many number of years that we don't need to go into. Um, uh, I already do have about five clients and interviews set up with about as many for the next coming month. I do say, take that as a very good sign and hope it to grow. Personally, I do want a balance. I want the right clients, ones that I can build long lasting relationships with and uh, really grow their business along with mine. Okay, thanks. Um. If the judges can, um, you should be able to score the, hopefully the, uh, the pitches as they present so that you can remember what, we try to do it as simple as possible, the form, so that you can remember what, what, their, what their pitch is like and it can be fresh in your memory. We'll also have a break after the next one so you can catch up on folks uh, if needed. All right, so Ali, I think we need to move on, right? We need to move on to... Yes, thank you, Reina. Thank you, Reina. All right. Next is Diana. Super excited to, to hear your pitch and your update from, uh, from your journey. Thanks, I'll start by sharing my screen. All right, can everyone see that? Yes. Yes, yeah, now we can. Great. <clears throat> it's been said, before you can know someone's experience, you have to walk a mile in their shoes. 
But have you ever rolled a mile in someone else's wheelchair? Non-disabled designers can often fall into the trap of designing what they think people with disabilities want instead of actually taking the time to find out what they need. I started Inclu Design to create products for this long overlooked population. It started with an apple core. One day I was chatting with my friend Sarah as she ate an apple. There were no trash bins around, so she needed to take the core with her to throw it out. As a wheelchair user, Sarah needs both hands to maneuver around. She tried to put the apple core on her lap, but it kept rolling off. Sarah ended up asking me to carry the trash for her instead, even though it was clear she would have preferred to do it herself. In that moment, I wondered how else our inaccessible world makes life unnecessarily challenging for Sarah. Given that there are 6 million Americans who use a wheelchair, you might be shocked at how inaccessible lots of everyday tasks can be. Take grocery shopping. What, and more importantly, who don't you see here? You might imagine the electric shopping carts you see in many stores would make it easy, but they require a user to leave their personal chair unattended while they shop. Many wheelchair users are forced to rely on placing the plastic hand baskets available on their lap, but they have to hold the basket while also maneuvering their chair. So it's really easy for their groceries to just fall off. Our product, the Lap Snap, remains securely on your lap, making shopping a breeze. The Lap Snap is the world's only shopping basket designed with and for wheelchair users. It's a collapsible carry-all with a versatile strap that allows you to carry items hands-free. With the Lap Snap, we aim to help wheelchair users increase their independence by enabling them to do more tasks by themselves, including shopping, doing laundry, gardening, or household chores. Allow me to introduce myself. I'm Diana Perkins. I'm an engineer with multiple years of experience in the field of product design for disabled populations. And I started Inclu Design, a Rhode Island-based product design firm creating products that empower individuals with disabilities around the world. We recently finished the beta testing of our product and the reviews are great. We launched on Kickstarter and hit our funding goal in just one week. Now we're raising a $500,000 seed round to allow us to make key hires reduce our manufacturing costs, market our product with disabled influencers, and more. The Lap Snap is the first of many products we intend to create collaboratively with the disability community. Join us and let's figure out together how you can help us make the world more accessible for everyone. Woo! <laughs> thank you, Diana. Thank you, thank you. Really excited and excited that I got to be a part of your Kickstarter campaign. So congrats. All right, any questions for Diana? I loved it, Diana. I thought, first of all, what, one of the other things I, I was just thinking in my head, and I would imagine this, you know, that a lot of people with disabilities have dogs and how could they actually have, create one as, or is there a way to buckle it up in that, in that contraption and stuff? So I'm curious about that. And also I'd love to know, what is the competitive landscape like? Sure, so to start, uh, we do have some people who carry their dogs around in it. I know one woman who has six tiny dogs that she's been carrying around, which is adorable. Um, it's also great to keep dogs out of your food. Our friend Sarah, or, I'm sorry, our friend Tina uh, has giant Great Danes um, that would always eat her snacks in her lap before she could get to the couch. And so she uses the lap step. It has a cover that goes over the top. She uses that to keep them out of her food. Um, in terms of the competitive landscape, there's not a lot of competition because honestly, big design firms don't really see this market as worth pursuing or that it's a niche market, even though 26% of Americans have some form of disability. Our closest competitor at the time, or at the moment, is the lap stacker. It's two retractable straps that you can buckle above your lap, which is great for something like books or other flat stackable items, but doesn't really work well for grocery shopping, laundry or other things like that, where you have a lot of little small round perhaps items that don't necessarily stack in a neat tower. Diana, really good pitch, really amazing, you know, classic product market fit kind of a thing. Um, What's next? Is, is the company going to be based on a single product? You've got stuff in mind and what's your, what's your trajectory? What, what do you think your milestones are? Help me peek into the business. 
Thank you. Yeah, no, like I said, the lab snap is the first of many products that I want to create with the disability community. We have some easy next steps in the work. We are working on a smaller version for children or people who just have smaller wheelchairs, um, a modified version for people who use a walker instead of a wheelchair, uh, especially as the population ages, that's a much larger market, um, as well as a modified version for people who are quadriplegic or have limited hand mobility. So it has magnetic snaps instead of the parachute clips that we use now, as well as a long single strap that they can put around their shoulders instead of the two uh, individual hand straps right now. Uh, and I got into this not to make, you know, not to blow it up to a $50 billion company and IPO. I got into it because this is what I want to do with my life. Um, my pie in the sky dream for Inclu is to become, you know, the IDO of products for disabled populations or for those of you who aren't in Google design and product design, you know, like the Google of product for disabled populations. I want this to be the go-to place when your company needs a, you know, product designed with accessibility in mind, we're the people you call. That's amazing. That's really is. Thank you. Thank you. Diana, Diana I wanted to ask you what uh, it costs to make price per unit and where, where are you getting the materials? Sure. So it's completely American made. Um, right now, the costs per unit are fifty three fifty eight, but we can bring that down with larger quantities. Um, and I'm really proud to be partnering with an organization called Peckham Incorporated in Michigan. They're our soft goods manufacturer, which makes up the majority of the labor involved in making the product. And they're a nonprofit that does job training and helps with finding employment opportunities for those with disabilities and other barriers to employment. So they train them in soft goods manufacturing, as well as I think they have five other um, different components that they can train them in. And then they help them get jobs in the greater Michigan area in those jobs. Hi, Diana, it's Barbara. Um, I was so happy to, to um, have met you earlier and to have been involved in your Kickstarter and, and then to be able to donate the product that, um, that I purchased on your behalf. And so congratulations, I think that's amazing. And um, so what is the MSRP and are, there, are you gonna develop programs on your platform to help provide um, your amazing products for those that might not be able to afford it? Or are you thinking about how um, to really get the product out there more broadly because with a $53 landed cost, it seems like it might be out of reach for some people to afford. Definitely, thank you. Um, one of the main things that we want the, um, that we would use the money from this evening tonight is to create a uh, injection mold that would help us reduce the part cost of our base by 83%, which would be amazing. Um, as well as, um, sorry, the, so the MSRP right now, it sells retail um, in a couple of stores and on our website for $150. However, we are working to bring that down as well as we're working on a price differentiated model. So a lot of our target users are wheelchair users on SSDI, which is social security disability insurance, which means they have fixed government income. Um, and so they don't have necessarily a lot of disposable income. Um, and so we are working on a differentiated model where people who are on SSDI would pay less for the product and those who are able to work would pay more. And so far the wheelchair users we've spoken to on both sides of that equation have been largely in favor of it. Anna, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, a uh, quick question, and I may have missed this in the presentation, but can you speak to any patents that you have or kind of something more about the design and the intricacy of the design? Yes, thank you. We are uh, patent pending uh, on this product. We filed our provisional patent uh, last August and we just converted to a full utility patent in the US in um, May and we are currently working on our PCT application. Amazing. Well, Ali, how are we doing on time? Do we have time for one more question or should we go to break? Um, I think if no one else has any other questions, we could have a little bit of a four minute break. <laughs> if that's all right, Diana, you're welcome to answer any questions in the chat as always. Amazing. Well, let's take a four minute break um, so that the judges can look to the uh, score sheet and catch up on any any scoring that they need to do. Also for the people in the audience, I see we have 73 people, which is great. They, at the end, there'll be a poll and we'll do a fan favorite uh, award as well. So feel free to, uh, to take notes as we're going because we would love your input. All right, so Ali, when should we be back? 
For the sake of time, um, it will be a three minute break. So please return at seven. Amazing. All right. <clears throat> Are we back? Are we back? Excited. Um, let's see. Let's just make sure the judges are back. Thank you, Ali and Liz, for helping with the logistics of this. I don't know what we've <laughs> done without the whole spotlighting. Really, really appreciate your support on this. All right, so should we go to the next person who is Natalie? Super excited to hear about your journey. I've personally been really impressed by how much it's, uh, it's grown and evolved. So can't wait to hear about it. Thank you very much. Right, give me one sec so everyone can see. Okay. Hello, my name is Natalie Boyum. I am the president and founder of the Defeating Epilepsy Foundation. We are a 501c3 not-for-profit located in Southern California, and our mission is to provide the advocacy and educational resources needed to the epilepsy community and our society. I have been battling epilepsy for 41 years now, and I feel it is important to give back to my community and help those who are battling epilepsy live happy and productive lives. Epilepsy is a neurological disorder affecting 3.4 million Americans. One in 26 people will be diagnosed with epilepsy and one in 10 will experience a seizure. 
Despite being a common neurological disorder, many in society do not understand what epilepsy is. A study published in 2016 showed that individuals with epilepsy are 22 times more likely to commit suicide than the general population, resulting in a mental health crisis that is being ignored. People with epilepsy face higher levels of anxiety and depression due to the side effects of medications, discrimination in the workforce, and other life challenges. The Defeating Epilepsy Foundation is creating a program to offer mental health counseling through telemedicine services. According to the 2019 U.S. Census, around 46 of 47,000 citizens in the Inland Empire are battling epilepsy. Our goal is to get 2 to 5% of the population to take part in our project. Long term, we want to expand our program to other underserved areas. According to John Hopkins Medicine, telemedicine offers many advantages such as comfort and convenience. With many individuals with epilepsy unable to drive, telemedicine is a great option for them. We will use multiple resources to raise funds, bring in consistent revenue, and conduct research to help gain support and create long-term sustainability. To create sustainability, we will work with insurance companies to have the licensed psychologist bill for each session. Our goal is to receive $100 per session per client for one year. Even if we bring in only 1% of the population into our program, we will generate $552,000 in revenue, exceeding our operational cost of $300,000. We are working to establish a grant to help those who do not have insurance receive services. We are seeking $300,000 to hire a licensed psychologist and social worker to manage and operate the program. We will be keeping service costs down by having graduate students who are working to meet their clinical requirements work with us. This is a common practice used by many organizations with similar programs. Why us? Our competitors do not offer any services such as this. The closest is an eight-week program focused on mild depression. Eight weeks is not enough for many who are battling epilepsy. I have gone through such a similar program myself due to a traumatic experience, and I understand the value of such a resource being available. I thank everyone for their time today, and if there are any questions I can answer regarding our team, startup cost, I'm happy to answer them now. Natalie, great presentation. Um, quick question. So you talked about trying to reach the 1%. Um, yes. Could you share your ideas with me on how you were, how you're going to go about reaching that 1%? Yes, we are currently working with a number of organizations here in the local area. We are working with universities such as the University of Riverside, and we are also working with smaller um, community clinics in the organization in, here in our area, as well as other collaborative um, organizations that serve nonprofits. I'm also partnered with the Epilepsy Alliance of Africa, or America, I'm sorry, and we are working to network to um, find other clinics that will be willing to take part in this so that their patients can gain access to this service. Thank you. Natalie, curious a little bit about your, um, your tech costs and stuff like that. And have you looked at the no code uh, and bubble IO as well uh, to create this in a, a less expensive way? Um, we have been looking into that. What we have been doing for tech costs is I'm partnered with somebody here in the organization, in our local organization, who's going to be helping with that. I'm also partnered with the University of New Mexico's Project ECHO program, which we will be getting free services for telementoring and being able to keep um, a data sheet on this to show how many people are taking part in the region. And we've also brought on a friend of mine who has a PhD in statistics. He's going to be helping with the database and helping to network through other academic organizations to help gain support to keep our costs down. Woo! Go Natalie, I love it. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> amazing, amazing. Um, any more questions for Natalie? I, I 
actually have one, Diego. Um, Natalie, is there an end game of um, government reimbursement for these health services? Is there a B to G strategy? I know you're a nonprofit, but it, it, do you expect uh, folks to have a reimbursable service through the platform? That is my goal long term. Right now, we launched a year ago. So that's why we're working with a lot of the um, bigger organizations right now being so new. My goal in the next two years, once I'm operational for three years, that we can partner with the CDC. There are quite a bit of um, grants for projects like this for advocacy projects for epilepsy, but become, being so new right now, I'm very limited to um, applying for bigger funds. So what I'm doing short term to show the um, government how serious we are and realizing this is something to create long-term um, sustainability has to start simple. So I'm partnering with the University of Washington with Dr. Robert Frazier, who is the creator of PACES. And what PACES is, it's a program that teaches people with epilepsy the importance of overall care. So we will be doing the training and then offering the classes to our organization to teach them about medication and side effects, the importance of nutrition, alleviating stress and getting a good night's sleep, when they do bail depression, what resources and tools they can use to prevent themselves from really going down a dark path and developing suicide tendencies. So we're using a lot of um, different tools to work towards our long-term goal. Amazing. Um, oh, we have one minute remaining. So if there are any, uh, any other questions, we, we can probably take one more. From, if not, we can uh, we can move on. Thank you, Natalie. Thank really, you. Really, really appreciate it. Oh, there we go. Okay, let's see who is next. All right, next up we have Julia. Hi, thank you. I'll Hello. share my screen now. Okay. Okay, are you able to see it? Yes. Okay, awesome. Hello everybody, my name is Julia Dunfron. My brand is Touch Adaptive and it's adaptive fashions for the disabilities you can't see. Have you ever felt anxious, depressed or have panic attacks? If you have, you are not alone. Anxiety disorders are the most common mental illness. In the US alone, it's affecting 40 million people. Now, what if I told you there was a drug-free option that can help anxiety, depression, and panic attacks? I wanna start off looking at this picture. What could possibly be wrong? She's happy, she's smiling, she just got her master's at Parsons School of Design. Well, I'm here to introduce the me you can't see. I was diagnosed with ADHD, anxiety, and panic disorder. For many years, I suffered in silence because I could not physically see what was wrong with me. My brother at a young age had a stroke and I saw him suffer the same disabilities as well. So this is a dedication to the people suffering in silence. The global adaptive um, clothing market is gonna grow to 400 billion by 2026. So here is our product. The Touch Crew Neck Sweatshirt was specifically and compassionately designed to soothe, delay, or even avoid the onset of those symptoms. So by pulling down the sweatshirt, you'll have the inside of the cuff, the real star here, there'll be a sensory texture, which you'll be able to press on certain nerves of your hand that can help you calm down. These will be 100% sustainable, made with the luxurious products, and it's gonna really help those panic moments. So for thousands of years, specifically since 2300 BC, billions of people have used reflexology to cure. According to reflexologists, applying on our pressure points on your fingers to the pituitary glands on your thumbs and the fingertips that send neurons to your brains that help you with panic moments. It helps with breathing and panic attacks and also anxiety and helps you to calm down. It overall gives your brain and body something to distract from those panic thoughts. Here are our competitors. Many of our competitors um, are gearing towards either children or they're not really gearing towards any invisible disabilities. Um, a lot of them are gearing towards 
um, other disabilities that you can see right now, but there is not one competitor on the market that is gearing towards the specific age group that I'm going after and um, invisible disabilities. So I actually was not diagnosed until I was 17 years old. And after speaking to many psychologists and doctors, I realized that a lot of these anxiety, depression, and behavioral disorders don't develop until later in life. So these are gearing towards that market, towards people who maybe aren't able to get diagnosed or not fully understand what's going on, but this is something that they can get that can help them. Here's just a little bit of our marketing plan. We're gonna be a unisex brand. We really wanna normalize treating mental health. And we are asking for $100,000. And this is just a little graph that what everything will go to. Help us help others suffering in silence. Thank you. <clears throat> Amazing. Congrats. All right. Questions for Julia. I think, oh, somebody is speaking already. Go ahead. Yeah, lovely presentation. Um, and I'm just trying to understand, like, if they're not quite sure, if an individual isn't quite sure that they've been diagnosed or things are just not feeling right, how would they know to reach out to you that this could be something that could be helpful? Well, definitely. Um, what's great about our product is, is that this isn't something that has to be displayed or you don't have to even be diagnosed. Um, but even if you're not, people feel panic moments or anxiety, and maybe you feel yourself having this a lot or in certain circumstances. Um, I know I would get very bullied in school. So sitting in a classroom was really triggering for me. So having this um, product can just help you in those moments, um, not fully just diagnosing anybody. Yeah, and, and so is it like, is it your primary garment or is it like a sweater, something you would put on top of it, of your, your t-shirt or something like that? Yeah, it's, um, you can wear it, um, it's just a sweatshirt, but there's no hood or anything around the neck because that can actually be very triggering. Um, so, but we, through the line, we want to also develop more products as well, other clothing items. Thank you. Thank you. Julia, I was going to ask you, um, uh, I was going to sneak in as two questions, two parts. Uh, the, the first question, this is very creative and I appreciate, um, uh, the way that you have packaged, uh, ra a rather new concept for some reflexology with a very common garment, sweatshirt. Are you at all concerned about educating consumers about what reflex reflexology is and what um, track record it has in actually solving the problem that you've identified? So that, that's my first question. Uh, the second is, how are you gonna make, make these products? You know, wh where are you getting the fabric, the, the production uh, of the garments? Yeah, um, great questions for the first one. Um, I don't really worry about it, be, um, people, you know, using reflexology, because actually in those panic moments, you can't really think of what to do next, you know, or that those nerds don't really do that. But sometimes a lot of people just grab something and they just want to hold on to that. And just having that can, you know, trigger those reflexology, trigger those neurons to your brain to help you calm down. Um, so yeah, I'm definitely realizing that people can really just use this and just have this as a comfort and something to fidget with. And um, as for the manufacturing, um, I really believe in you know sustainability, fair labor. So um, I know a great farm. I worked at a company called Eco Fashion Corp, and they have um, metaware, and their farm is in India. Um, so I plan to partner with them um, because they have fair labor, fair wages, and it's also 100% sustainable and 100% organic cotton. Julia, great product, great introduction. The, the, the thing that I'm struggling with is um, I believe completely that if they got a, ha you know, if they got their fingers on the product, it will be calming and everything that you say I'm just wondering how you would, how they would know of the product and what are you going to say about the product to compel people to buy it? So that's my one, one question. My second question is, 
uh, uh, having it on a sweatshirt seems a little restrictive. I know you said you're probably going to have other products, maybe like a wristband or something like that. But I think my first question is really causing me to think a little more. How is it going to be branded, advertised, positioned in the mind of the consumer? Yeah, um, I'm so happy you asked this question because working, an answer. <laughs> working in the fashion industry, um, I really want to create this brand as a community. I don't want this to just be a moment. I want this to be a movement to speak about mental health, to be an advocate for mental health. And we have something that can help you in those um, panic or calming moments. But I want this to be a brand that people know that we speak about it we are advocates for it. And, you know, having this brand message and this brand story, people will be more compelled to come to us um, knowing that we have a specific reason for this and a message for this. And it's to change and normalize mental health and being okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you're I, muted. <laughs> I just realized that. I think I saw Ali say that it was the one minute warning. So I think we're we're at time, right? So should we go to uh, last but certainly not least, uh, Christy, the grilling lady. Let me for just a moment um, stop my video and then I am going to share my screen and I will be back on. All right. All right. Great. Oh, um, Natalie, uh, oh, sorry, Julia, I see Hannah put a ch uh, question in the chat, just FYI. Thank you. Oh, goodness, sorry. You guys caught me. I was trying to uh, eat a taco off the taco grill just now. I'm Christy Hohen. Talk of the Table is my company, and table grilling is the solution. I'm sorry, I got past. Um, there we go. I'm sorry. Many um, families are, have a lifestyle challenges right now, and they're not coming together at the table like they used to. There are a lot of different dietary restrictions that make it hard to make one meal for everybody. And a lot of you just don't know how to cook. And that's why table grilling is the solution. It's fun, flexible, and nutritious. You can make delicious food for your family that's healthy, and you're bringing people back to the table. They're grilling their own food together and talking, and they, when, no matter if you're paleo or keto or you have allergies, you can cook different foods in different ways to please each of your family members and you can learn how to cook. Table grilling is like combining Swiss raclette, teppanyaki and Korean barbecue into one. The target market are families in their 30s and urban professionals. And that demographic accounts for more than 60,000 households. They are calling it more popular than the fondue pot, and I believe it. My competition is zero. I have developed this way to cook using an ordinary griddle on the table in a very unique way. I have created an entire new category in the small appliance division. Uh, my customers are repeat customers. You don't buy two or three or four toasters, but you will buy two or three or four table grills, as well as all of the accessories and the colors and the seasonal ranges, as well as a massive product line. Why me? Well, I, my love and passion for cooking goes into everything I do, and I have developed this method. I teach people how to table grill, and I'm a master at converting recipes. When you invest in me, you've invested in someone who has battled and thrived. I'm 100% committed to making it a household name. Food and Beverage Magazine and T-Mobile. That's my people now, it's so exciting. I'm an up and coming keynote speaker and a frequent podcast guest. 
as well as being featured twice in Food and Beverage Magazine just recently. And next week, I'm filming with T-Mobile for a nationwide campaign. I'm also writing my first book. That is how I'm building a dynamic social media audience that is the perfect table grilling customer. My revenue is going to come through affiliate products and services, sponsored products, and co-branding. And financially, we're looking for 12 months of financing to uh, reach about 25,000 transactions. That will, in, that will equate to about $375,000 in revenue next year. I have a very extensive six month timeline and it's going to generate revenue and make talk of the table a household word. The next two or three years, I'm planning to have an entire line of private labeled branded items that are completely mine. If you have any questions at all, I'm happy to answer. Thank you so much for letting me present today. Amazing. Thank you, Christy. I'm hungry just watching you present. Oh my God. <laughs> I definitely want a piece of that. Um, any questions for Christy? I just want one of those. Where can I get one of those? <laughs> I can hook you up <laughs> as an affiliate. Um, I will be directing everybody to exactly where you can buy the products on the market. And then later they'll be available um, as a de fully developed table grill specifically to um, what I'm um, dreaming of. I've been working with the um, small manufacturers uh, I shouldn't say small appliance manufacturers. They're the largest in the world, uh, Presto. And um, they are so excited about this product, but Presto themselves, um, just like all of the companies now, you need to be a social media powerhouse first, and then they want to uh, co-brand with you. Christy, this, this uh, begs two practical questions. Uh, one, where does it plug in if it's on your dinner table? And number two, or does it not plug in? And number two, what about small children and hot surfaces? Great, yeah, great question. So we have um, researched it uh, with a small appliance manufacturer, Presto. Uh, we researched it for UL usage and is perfectly safe to use on a table with a um, an extension cord. So there are a variety of different ways you can take your cord, um, uh, make it as safe as possible. Just like any kind of cooking, you know, you have um, hot items and then you have to watch small children. But I take a Velcro piece, which would be included in the kits if, when we get it to market and they um, will take um, your cords and I wrap them um, tightly against the leg of the table and then it cannot be pulled off of the table. And I have three grandchildren who love table grilling and they have done it since they were little. Um, we just make sure that everything is, you know, a safe distance away, just as you would eating a bowl of soup or anything else at your table, right? Um, you keep it out of those little hands and anything they could grab and, and pull it toward them. It would just be those kind of um, warnings that we would be including very, um, carefully in any of the instructions. And, and then does that include ex other accessibility features re related to how you use the equipment? Yeah, I have it very, yes. And, and that was, of course, that was the first place we started when I started working with the, um, their development team is what does that look like? What does the safety look like? What do the procedures look like? And so uh, they uh, had a little powwow with their UL guys and um, underwriters uh, limited, I think listing underwriters limited. Anyway, so it's what that has, it's one of those big um, hurdles that has to be um, uh, jumped to make sure that everything is, um, according to safety and everything above board. And so you always see those little tag like UL listed. And that means you have, um, they have passed all of these safety requirements and uh, this has for that use. I just want to say move over Martha Stewart. 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you, Barbara. You know what? It, as a disabled woman, um, I'm 56. Okay, so this isn't uh, you know a spring chicken coming into this uh, this realm of social media. And I have had the most amazing friends who had encouraged me and said because I always thought somebody else needs to be doing it, not me. You know, I'm, I, I'm, I'm missing both my legs. I'm, you know, I'm this, I'm that, I'm not pretty enough. I'm not this. And um, they've encouraged me. And the more I've done all of this and the more I get in front of the camera, um, the more at ease I get and my enthusiasm shows. And so that's how I ended up. Um, I am going to be on this uh, video with, um, T-Mobile, and it is uh, people who are defying their age and doing scary, wonderful things at older age. And so I'm so excited to be featured on one of their videos. Um, great. So I think I saw uh, Ali say that is time. Oh my God, it went really, really fast. Um, Oh, I want to. <laughs> so, um, super excited about this. Uh, we will be giving two awards, like we said, one for the judges, uh, from the judges, and one from every one of you. So, while the judges are tabulating the scores, uh, I'm going to launch a poll and I ask everyone to please um, vote for their favorite. And then we'll see who uh, who the winner of the community award is. Let's see. There we go. All right. percent there. Great. Hopefully let's get to 90%. Please. Oh my God. And my I'm last name is H O E H N, <laughs> just so you know. <laughs> Sorry, can you repeat that, Christy? Did I did oh, it's I just on there my name is spelled um strange. I am sorry. I am sorry. No, it's okay. All right. All right, we are still waiting for some folks. So we can leave it up a little bit more. Um, fellow cohort members, feel free to vote as well. And I will. So exciting. It's 7.30. 7.30 Eastern time. By the way, I really want to take a moment also to acknowledge and thank the interpreters that are here. They are doing a phenomenal job and um, I'm really, really grateful that they were able to join us. So thank you, Sarah and Taylor. Really appreciate you having, being here. Amazing. Okay, so while we do that, I'm not gonna close the um, I'm not gonna uh, close the poll quite yet. But while we do that, I want to let uh, there were other participants in the cohort as well. So I want to make sure uh, they also get a chance to introduce themselves. Um, if you can keep your introductions for a minute, so that we get a chance to go through everyone, that would be great. Uh, Lissy, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? She is here. Hi, Diego. Lissy is going to be introducing herself through the chat. So oh, okay. okay, perfect. So who's next? Um, we could go to Karen. Perfect. 
Hi, yes, I'm here. My name is Karen Willison. I have cerebral palsy. I use a power wheelchair. And I have many years of experience as a professional writer, editor, and advocate working in online media. So I'm using my knowledge to launch a new resource for the disability community. It's called the Ability Toolbox, and it's a self-help community for people with disabilities and chronic illnesses to share practical advice and life hacks. We also support disabled artisans and small business owners by giving them a platform to promote their work. The Ability Toolbox currently features a variety of informational and supportive articles by people with disabilities. Uh, we believe it's very important to pay disabled writers for their time and for sharing their valuable lived experience. And we monetize the site primarily through affiliate marketing, where we get a commission if someone um, buys one of the products recommended on the site. And I'm eventually also looking to expand into display advertising and strategic partnerships. Um, if you'd like to learn more or work with us, uh, you can visit our website, which is theabilitytoolbox.com or email us through the website or at theabilitytoolbox at gmail.com. Thank you so much. I've really enjoyed participating in this cohort. Amazing. Thank you, Karen. All right. Next up, we have Kirsten. Kirsten, are you here? I saw, oh, am I muted? No, no. I saw her. Let's see, Kirsten, Kirsten. All right. While she is getting set up, we can go to Cristalo. Diego, she is set up. She just oh, was she is. Oh, okay. Sorry. I just, yeah. I'm sorry. My, I keep forgetting about the mute. So, hi everybody. I'm just overwhelmed with these six ladies. I, you know, been working with them for 12 weeks, and they are the amazing. So, anyway. So, hello everyone. I'm, uh, I'm Kirsten Joan. I'm owner of Grit Tales, just outside Washington D.C. Um, in Herndon, Virginia. And I basically write uh, tales uh, to uh, normalize disability um, for, for inclusive storytelling, <laughs> sorry. So my, like all of us, I want to through fiction, I want to create a perspective fiction for both the disabled and the non-disabled. If you want to find me, I'm at kirstenjoan.com. Um, my company is called Grit Tales, and give me a second, I'll try to give it so when you see it around. Oh, yay! <laughs> cool logo, good logo. So, yeah, so I'm, I'm just saying, you know, when you see that label in the future, you'll know that is one of my products. So it's a pleasure to meet you all. Thank you. Amazing. All right, let's go to, let's see, I'm losing the order here. Chris Tallo, do you wanna take a moment to introduce yourself? Oh, oh, wait, we can't, we can't hear you. I think the interpreters need to unmute. Let's see, Sarah, there we go. Hi, yes. Yes. Okay, the interpreter can see me. Okay, perfect. Awesome. Hello, everyone. My name is Chris Stallo. My last name is Tazalia. I am the founder and CEO of Oracle and Bookworm. We are located in Rockville, Maryland. Well, Oracle and Bookworm, our mission is to sell uh, innovative, uh, what is the word I'm looking for? Innovative physical and downloadable designs and stands for books uh, like this. You can see an example here. Uh, also for phones, tablets, laptops, and binders. The goal uh, within this mission is to promote literacy, both for, both for children and for adults alike. 
So uh, it's been, you know, short and sweet, but you can see this product right here kind of demonstrated. I've got a book here and you flip it open and it stands just like that. And then it's very easy to go ahead and flip through those pages as well. Just like this. Amazing. So, yeah, and this is, of course, amazing for visual storytelling. Within it, you can set the book down and still be able to tell the story. So thank you so much uh, for having me within this cohort. And that's my introduction. Great. Uh, so cool. And for everyone on the call, I'm going to put, we have a booklet with everyone's uh, business and bio. So you can access it and see more details about the program, the sponsors, and everyone's company as well. Um, all right, so Prudence, you want to uh, introduce yourself? Thank you, thank you. Today has been amazing. Tonight, I do not envy the judges. I wish everyone could win. Um, my name is Prudence Shaw, and amazingly enough, the supply of accessible events outstrips the demand in the DMV area. So I want to create a web-based marketplace that brings cultural venues together with deaf, hard of hearing, and disabled communities. I promote accessible events, create new standards for communicative and architectural access, provide consultancy to the venues, and partner with artists, performers, and others in creating live demonstrations of how the art and performances are created to draw in these underrepresented groups. I also have a long-term goal of having deaf, hard of hearing and disabled artists and creators actually be featured in the cultural venues. Thank you. Thank you, Prudence. Thank you, thank you. All right, and before we announce the uh, the winner, I I am so so excited to hear from a very special guest that um, that it's going to be such a treat. But before we do that, I want to remind the judges we need we really need your scores. So if you haven't scored uh, all the women uh, who are participating, please do that because um, Ali and Liz. Are, are helping tabulate, so we need those scores. Um, Diego, if I could just read um, Lisi's introduction, if yes. that would be all right? Yes, please. Thank you. Um, Lisi says, apologies, I'm not able to get on video right now. Uh, I'm Lisi Whitworth, CEO and co-founder of Aventida, incorporated in Washington, DC. We are pivoting from building a SAAS solution to researching and developing uh, affordable micro solutions that help diverse and DEI professionals create fully accessible and inclusive experiences online and at events for their employees and audience. This program has been great. Thank you all for being here tonight. Amazing. All right. So thank you, Lissy. And I am so, so excited to introduce uh, May Soon. I am total fan girling right here. Really excited. I'm proud to say that I also have cerebral palsy. So, so very excited to share that with you, May Soon. Thanks for being here. Hello, everybody. My name is Maysoon Zayed. And for those of you who don't know me, as Diego mentioned, I'm not drunk. I have cerebral palsy. Um, and I always like to say in the Oppression Olympics, I'd win a gold medal because I'm Palestinian, I'm Muslim, I'm disabled, I'm divorced, I'm BIPOC, and I'm from Jersey. So uh, I don't think anyone should try to compete with that. Uh, 
against me. But I'm not here as me. Um, I'm here to represent the iconic Maureen Arbus. For those of you who don't know who um, Maureen is, she is my fairy god mentor, but she is also one of the most cherished, best allies, advocate, and later joiners in the disability community. Uh, Lorraine's beloved older sister, Cookie, um, I don't know if she was older or younger actually, but I do know her name was Cookie. Lorraine's sister, Cookie, had cerebral palsy. So Lorraine grew up, grew up upfront and personal with um, disability and was exposed to two of the most important things, I believe, in the disco. Disco is disability community, disco, we're the party. Um, one was that her mother and father, her parents were huge advocates for accessibility. They fought for the first accessible bathrooms. They fought for curb cuts. And Laureen took that mantle to a whole nother level when she began her disability advocacy focusing on a very holistic approach to disability. One, making sure that we had positive representation in media because media and positive images can actually save lives. Two, ensuring accessibility, universal accessibility in design, in employment and in education. And three, throwing these parties at her lair that totally include like disabled people who never got invited to anything. We got to party like rock stars with Laureen. She is like the most fun, coolest person you've ever met. She really wanted to be here tonight, but unfortunately the tech God said no. And she wasn't able to sign on. So she tossed me in as a replacement. I literally had no idea what was going on. Diego's my witness. I was <laughs> working till like five minutes ago. And I was like, I don't know what this is. So I signed on and I listened. And I just have to say, I love disability Shark Tank, Wendy Diamond. This is such a good idea. <laughs> I totally have the people who I'm like, I want to give you money. And I have the people where I'm like, I just want your product. Can I like get your product? Um, I want to give you all some advice you don't want to hear. I don't know because I literally don't know. Are all of the applicants disabled? Yes. yes. Oh, okay, good. Because, you know, disabilities are invisible. And I was like, I don't know. Are they disabled or not? And I was going to say, if you're not, you better hire some disabled people because nothing about us without us. But here you are with us. So I don't even need to tell you that. Um, I wanna say that it was an absolute privilege hearing these ideas. I am very much looking forward to stealing them, patenting them and mm -hmm. making grotesque amounts of money myself on all of your ideas. Is, is, that, is that an option, Diego? No? Mm -hmm. oh, okay. no. Um, <laughs> I think these ideas are brilliant. I am so excited to see where you go regardless of whether this award is awarded to you or not. And I really want to applaud every single one of you for coming out here and putting your heart and soul behind your creation and your product. I cannot imagine the pressure. I, I just can't. And I watched you all with such grace, but there was one thing that cracked me up. Every single time a question was asked, the person asked said, that's a really good question. And I was just waiting for one of you to be like, that is a ridiculous question. Why have you asked me such a thing? I don't know. I was told there'd be no meth. So I'm very proud of all of you for not only presenting with such grace and pride, but also for having the answers, for knowing your product, for proving what I have told people in media and in corporations worldwide, giving opportunities to disability is not a favor. There is incredible talent in this community that is untapped. And I am so privileged, excited, and blessed to have been part of this, seeing who wins, who loses, and who changes the world. And I just can't wait to, as Dr. Seuss says, see all the places you will go. And I know that Lorene is going to revel in the stories I tell her about what you've created in this space. So 
get vaccinated if you can, can. And um, I wish you all the success. Oh my God, Mason. Thank you so much. That was such a powerful, powerful way to, to close us off. Really, really great. And really honored to have you be here. Please tell Lorreen that she can be my fairy godmother as well. She's my fairy god mentor. Fairy god it's mentor, there we go. Yeah. There you go. Um, no, it was, it was great having you. Thank you so much for joining us, especially last minute. Really, really appreciate it. So we have um, the winners and I wanna let um, Ali introduce the winners because they've done such amazing, amazing job. So, but let's do this. Liz, why don't you introduce yourself and you get to introduce, I'm gonna put it in the chat. You get to tell us who the, uh, the community favorite person is, and then we'll turn it over to, um, to Ali to introduce the, uh, the winner from the judges. Awesome, thank you no, so good. much, Diego. Good. Hi everyone, my name is Liz. I'm so, so happy to be here and to be involved with this project. I've been a little bit behind the scenes, um, but I have been able to watch these women um, just do amazing things. And I'm so proud to be a part of this. Uh, and I have tallied the numbers and while everyone did an amazing job, there is only one fan favorite winner and that is Miss Healy Cat Wells. Oh, thank you. Wait. No, no, no. Sorry, sorry. A little bit Oscar moment right now. Keely, you're the winner for the from the judges. I'm oh, sorry. My. No worries. No problem. You're still a winner. You're still a winner. That's all good. That is all good. That is all good. <laughs> Congrats, Keely. That means I get to announce found mm -hmm. fan favorite. Yes. Uh, Keely, if you have anything you want to say quick about being the winner of the of the cohort page competition. Oh my gosh, I think I'm just speechless right now. I'm like probably gonna cry. Um <laughs> thank you so much. And I'm just I feel really lucky to have been surrounded by these incredible women. Um, there's been, I'm, as through everyone's journey, there's always a lot that goes on behind the scenes and there's been a lot behind the scenes. Uh, and I just can't thank everyone enough for their support while everything's been, been happening. So I'm just incredibly grateful and can't wait to, to use, this, use this win uh, to, to continue to grow see talent and, and hopefully change many lives and, and create an amazing future for, uh, for us. So thank you so, so much. This is huge. Thank you, Keely. And I'm so excited to announce our fan favorite winner is Diana Perkins. Congrats. Ooh. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so excited. Um, so Diana nice. and Keely, please stay a few minutes after. But Diana, is there something you want to say? Um, just thank you to everyone who came. And thank you to all the amazing women who were in the cohort. I had such a wonderful time getting to know you all. And I'm so glad to be a part of this amazing community of disabled women entrepreneurs. Oh my God. It's been quite, quite an incredible journey. Thank you. Every and, and for those of you who know me, I know that I'm a stickler for time. So I'm so happy that we ended 10 minutes early. So happy. Um, to have everybody be a part of this conversation in such an important day. Thank you to the interpreters. Thank you to the judges. Thank you to Ali and, and, and Liz for helping behind the scenes. Thank you, Kim. You were truly my partner in crime on this. And uh, stay tuned because we have really exciting things coming up uh, over the next couple months. We'll be sure to uh, share updates as well. So thank you everybody uh, for being here. It, it's truly been an honor and I'm excited to share uh, news going forward.
Have a great night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Dega. Woo! Uh, and all of the cohort members have put their info in the chat. So please hold on to all of that info and it is in the booklet as well. Amazing. <clears throat> Keely and Diana, if you can stay on for a bit, as well as Liz and, and Ali, that would be great. Thank you, everybody else. Congratulations. I'll play some coffee house music while we wait. <laughs> okay, and I'm, I'm gonna stop the recording in a sec. Silence.